Well, hey, family, glad you're here and welcome home. If you are uh, joining us online, glad you have joined us. Has anyone enjoyed the online? Has anyone gone and used it themselves? I have. It is pretty awesome. So we're really grateful. Again, thanks for that to Steve. Listen, we're in a series. It's called Follow the Leader. And it's been an incredible series. We started it off with Kyle. And then last week, Garrett, uh, he shared in the series And today, if you're wondering why why I'm up here, you're probably thinking, I'm I'm preaching today. Well, no, I'm not. I'm just starting what has been a really awesome journey for us as a staff. Today, it's not just me that's going to be bringing the message, but our entire pastoral staff, which means myself, then we're going to have Garrett, Adam, Thomas, and then Kyle's going to wrap it up. So we're really excited about it. It's our first time ever doing it. And so you're going to join us on this little journey and adventure. So here's what I want you to do. Uh, grab the shoulder of the person next to you. Go ahead and do it. I know, don't, don't be weird. This is family. Goodness gracious. All right. Grab the shoulder. All right. All right. Here's what you're going to do. If, if you're at home and there's someone, grab your, your dog or your cat. And then here's what we're going to say. Hang on. All right. Thanks for humoring me. Follow the leader. Each week we've kind of touched on this concept, this ongoing principle, which is great leaders follow great examples. Here's the thing. As a disciple of Christ, we're all leaders in some way, shape, or form. We're either leading towards God or leading away from God. And so that's something that we've got to take seriously. So we all have to take time to pursue being a good leader. And in doing that, we learn that being a great one means following a great example. We have a passage that we're going to be in, but before we do that, today's principle is following Jesus means loving generously. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open your Bible to that. Um, If you like taking notes, today is a good day for that. I'm going to be taking notes These guys have prepared some really cool stuff, and so I'm excited about that. So if you have your Bibles and your notebooks, go ahead and get those ready. I'm going to read. If you could follow along with me, Matt, I'm going to read from my Bible, and you can follow along if you don't have your Bible on the projector screens. If I could speak all the languages of earth and angels but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but did not love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Now here's where we get to the part that we all know and we all love. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Prophecy and speaking is in unknown languages, and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. For our knowledge is partial and incomplete, and even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless." When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child, but when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, and I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. Three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Last week, Garrett talked, and he shared a pretty 
valid point. Great leaders serve like Jesus, and that serving should cost something. And today, our passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, gives us what that cost looks like, what that something is. And what that something is, is love. Now, I love food. As you can see, I kind of show a little bit. I've been eating a lot of food. I love food. Some of you know I love coffee. I do. You know I love coffee. Some of you know I love the Dodgers, despite of how we played last night and how we went. It is really bad. But a lot of the things we love are, are just kind of shallow, not really life-changing type of things. They're just basic things. And we use the word love and we apply it to things that aren't really that deep or that meaningful. But this morning, the word love is such a deep word that we can learn to acquire that the world wants to shape. The world wants to tell us love is whatever you want it to be. But God's word defines what that love is. What's really cool about the Bible is that is translated from the Greek in the time of Jesus' day. Uh, a lot of the writings were written in Greek. And so in the Greek, you had a lot of different characteristics for a word. Okay, so the word love is one of those words that has many characteristics. In the Greek language, there's about eight, maybe more. In the Bible, there's about six of them used. Today, I'm only going to reference three, but only one matters most today. So here's the three words. The first one is eros. All right, I want you to grab your seat in front of you. Because eros means love mostly, mostly of the sexual passion. There, I said it. I said it in church. Sexual passion. That's eros. All right, the next one is philia or philo. This one means love, affectionate regard, friendship. You know, the bromance. Okay, that's what that means, okay? But those two forms of the word love are not the one that matters most today. See, the one that matters most today is the word agape. Agape means love or generous love. The love of God for man and of man. Agape, this form of the word uh, of love, it has this ancient idea that expresses unconditional love of God for his children. And so today, we learn in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3, it says, If I give up everything I have to the poor and even sacrifice my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. And so the key word today is love. And without it, we are bankrupt. We are bankrupt without love. So, if leading like Jesus means serving should cost us something, and that cost is love, then how do we have this costly love? And that's what we're going to look at today. Say this principle with me. Following Jesus means loving generously. I think it's very fitting that the first two aspects of love that we get to examine today, that we get to talk about, are married to the word generosity, like H said. Um, and that's where we come to the very first bit of this love passage, right? Love is patient and kind. Now, we really have to think about this, love as patience and kindness. Do you know someone who is impatient yet generous, right? Because these things are married. Someone who's impatient and generous. Or do you know of a person who exudes generosity yet falls short in the kindness category? I battled the temptation to come up here and teach you about the true definitions of words that we use on the daily, like generosity or patience or kindness. However, I do think the definition of generosity is necessary today. And this definition, in short words, is to give more than was ever initially expected. Now let that sink in for a moment. Generosity means to give more than was ever 
initially expected. As people, we all fight the battle to make sure that our kids are kind or that we are kind, that the people around us are kind. We make sure to hold the door open for someone who wants the door held open for them. We try to do the kind thing so that way people see us as the kind person. And we daily let the thoughts and feelings rage through us that we must get what we can as fast as we can. We begin to become impatient. And if patience isn't in the wheelhouse, then forget kindness or any of those other love things because without patience, none of those other things are really going to happen. If we don't get our way when we want it, goodbye love, essentially. I'd like to take you to a place where I most often find myself fighting the battle with patience and kindness. This is where my brain goes, and some of you might be surprised, some of you probably won't be, but this is where my brain goes when I begin to think about patience and kindness, and that's food. More specifically, I think about the times as a staff that we go out to lunch on Tuesdays after staff meeting. Right? And we as a staff have been to what feels like just about every lunch establishment in Pittsburgh. Um, I'm not sure if we have yet. I'm sure we, if we made a list, there'd be a ton of them. But this is where I go. So today, with a, just a short story, I'll prove to you that love is generous in every and all circumstances. Now, isn't it so true that when we go out to lunch, we often put pressure on the person who waits on us? You might say we are being generous with our expectations because you better believe that we expect them to give us more than was ever initially expected. Think of the time when you were impatient with the waiter because he didn't fill up your drink fast enough. Or the time that you were less than kind when leaving a tip because they definitely didn't deserve the extra 15% you were going to give them on a $50 check. This is why patience is the first word we examine when we come to this. Impatience breeds partiality. Partiality to yourself. What you're saying when you're impatient is that your time is more important than anyone else's and your own personal desires matter more. Impatience is the root of selfishness. No wonder you don't see people with road rage or those huffing and puffing at a drive through window telling those around them about Jesus. Right? It just doesn't happen because Jesus is patient. Love is patient. Patience is the catalyst of true love. And this is why kindness comes next. If you fought the hard battle with patience and made your body and mind a slave to slowness, then, what's my place? Sorry. Kindness is its fruit. And it's the closest that you'll ever be to being like God being patient and kind. His spirit is kind, and kindness and generosity go hand in hand. Think about this one. How can you be kind the next time that you're out at lunch? Instead of holding the waiter or waitress to some unholy standard, set a tip amount in your mind before you ever figure out who's going to serve you. And then, every time that you're impatient, or every time that you're thinking about being unkind, raise the tip. 5%. And good luck being impatient or unkind for very long, because you're going to lose your checkbook after a while. And this is the reality. To put action to this, we have to choose to love generously in all circumstances. We have to choose it, because it's not always easy. So the next time you're at lunch and you think about being impatient with the waiter or waitress, remember that we serve a God who waited thousands of years for you to be born so that you could do something amazing with your life. The next time you want to be rude and leave a crummy tip for someone, remember we serve a God who doesn't give 12% because we just don't deserve it. We serve a God who gave it all, 100%, and then some on top of that. That is why following Jesus' example means loving generously. Love is patient and kind. Those are two tough things. Um, I, I wish that Paul had just stopped there because those two things are tough enough, but he doesn't stop there. He keeps going. and He says, love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude, and it does not demand its own way. In other words... Love is humble. 
That's what Paul is saying there. Love is humble. That's the key ingredient of all of those things that he mentions in this part of the passage. Love walks in humility. So we need to know what humility is. So I want to give you the most technical, the most theological, the most intellectual definition of humility that I can possibly think of. Are you ready? Here it is. Humility recognizes that it ain't about me. Say that with me. It ain't about me. I know some of you are grammar people. Your heads are about to explode right now. I don't care. Just say it. I'm kind of that way too. Say it with me. It ain't about me. That's humility and that's love. We have a, um, we have a gesture in our house and it goes like this. I think I've shared this with you before. This gesture in our house goes like this. That gesture in our house means the world doesn't revolve around you, pal. I say pal because it's often directed at me, right? (laughs) The world doesn't revolve around you. It's not about you. That's humility and that is love. Love isn't jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It doesn't demand its own way. You see, love doesn't get jealous over what other people have because it recognizes that it's not about me. Love doesn't pridefully boast and brag about my accomplishments because it recognizes that it's not about me. And love isn't rude because it realizes it's not about me. Now, I struggled with that a little bit. What's the connection between humility and rudeness? Well, think about it. When you're rude to somebody, when you're rude to somebody, it's because your needs, your wants, your expectations are not being met. And that's why you treat people rudely, right? We all do it. Garrett talked about that a little bit in the restaurant. So love doesn't act like that. Love doesn't do that. Love recognizes it's not about me. And so love isn't rude. Love also doesn't demand its own way because it realizes it's not about you. Think about your marriage. Think about your relationship with your siblings or with your parents or your kids or with your friends or with your coworkers. In those relationships, if things always have to be your way, if things always have to be on your terms, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. And you're not acting in love. You can tell that person till you're blue in the face, I love you, I love you, I love you. But if everything always has to be on your terms and never theirs, you're not showing love. It's not about you. It's not about me. Love doesn't do that. You know, Sarah and I have been married for 21 years, and yes, we've had a few fights over the years, just a few. Some of those fights were over little, piddly, stupid things, and some of those fights were over big things. Some of those fights were big things, uh, were big fights over big things. But you know what the common denominator is between all of them? I guarantee you every fight that Sarah and I have ever had, the common denominator was that one or both of us in that moment was failing to recognize that it's not about me. It's not about me. So if life isn't about me, then who is it supposed to be about? Well, Jesus tells us. He says, love God with everything that you have and everything that you are, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's how we practice humility. That's how we practice love. That's the order. We love God and we love people. Love God and love people. In fact, Paul goes on, he puts it this way in another place in Philippians chapter 2. He says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Think of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. And then you know what he does after that? Go read it later, Philippians chapter 2. Right after that, Paul goes on in one of the most beautiful, most theologically important passages in the Bible. He shows us how Jesus practiced that incredible, sacrificial, humble, self-giving love. So in other words, when we practice this kind of love, we're truly following the leader. So here's our action step. Get over yourself. Ouch, right? Ouch. 
Get over yourself. When you feel jealousy creeping in, get over yourself and choose to be happy for that person who has something that you don't. When you're tempted to be boastful and proud, get over yourself and stop drawing attention to yourself because it's not about you. When you want to be rude to somebody, get over yourself and choose instead to be kind because it's not about you. And when you want to insist on your own way and on your own terms, get over yourself and recognize that it's not about you. Choose to demonstrate love by getting over yourself and humbly recognizing it ain't about you me. Following Jesus' example means loving generously. Love is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. And that's 1 Corinthians 13. Five and six. In other words, love is not offended. Love is not offended. It's full of grace. I have a video to show us um, what offendedness looks like. I've been having life-changing results since I learned how to get offended. Now when people don't see things the way that I see them, I just get offended. And it teaches them how not to see things from their point of view. I'm offended that you would think you have the right to post that to your Facebook account. People have every right to see things from their perspective, as long as their perspective is the same as my perspective. Here's a water for you. I don't drink out of plastic. Why would you not know that? People who don't get offended are insecure, take no self-responsibility, and have no sense of purpose in life. I pray for them. JP, I don't even know why you're offended. I'm offended that you don't know how you offended me. JP, I wanted to uh, thank you and show my gift of appreciation by giving you my book because I know you, you need it, right? You're just assuming that I know how to read? There's three easy steps to getting offended by anything. Step one, listen to what someone says and then selflessly make it all about you by taking it personally, even if it has nothing to do with you. I really want you to have a great life. You're assuming my life isn't good enough the way it is? How dare you? Step two, you wanna create a large amount of tension inside your body. You really wanna concentrate on bringing the tension to your stomach, your chest, and your face. How are you doing today, JP? I'm offended that you would have to ask. Step three, now project outrage onto the other person. This will make it seem like you're getting rid of the tension inside your body, but it actually drives it down deeper inside you. And because it stays there, it'll make it even easier for you to get offended next time. I'm offended that you would wear that shirt. I'm actually a little offended by that. I'm offended that you're offended by that. Since I've learned how to get offended, I bring huge amounts of joy to everyone in my life. People feel like they're free to just be themselves when they're around me. I'm just happy I can make such a big difference in the world. I think she's a pretty attractive woman. I'm offended that you would think I'm attracted to women. Aren't you attracted to women? Yeah, but you have no right to just assume that. I'm offended that you don't have my new book yet. Offended that you would play that video, right? (laughs) But love is not offended. It's not offended. Have you ever been so filled with love for someone, so overcome with feelings of gratitude and appreciation for their presence in your life, so moved to affection that it literally seemed to spill over? I mean, you guys know what I'm talking about. It could be with your spouse. It could be with your best friend. It could be with just a family member, you guys are hanging out, and you're just feeling like, man, I just, I'm, I'm really, like, I'm spilling over with love and appreciation for this person. And then, for whatever reason, 
that person is having a bad day. And they're in a bad mood for whatever reason. Maybe they got a bad tip. I, I don't know. Or, or their favorite sports team lost or whatever the case may be. And then that affection is not mutually returned to you as you would have hoped. And then within a moment, all of that love that was so welled up within your heart, it's gone. And it's dried up. And it replaces itself with anger, with rudeness, with angst, with hurt, with resentment. And you just, the path just gets started. But love is not offended. So does this mean that we should never be bothered by anything? I don't think so. However, there is a big difference between acting and reacting. Our goal as followers of Christ should be that in any situation, we find a spot where we can reconcile this. Our response is our responsibility. I want to say that again. Our response is our responsibility. Love is not offended. It's full of grace. When we act offended to a person, here's what we're doing. We're creating a boundary. We're separating ourselves and our minds. And we're doing so without providing any space for reconciliation or understanding. There is no grace in that at all. That's saying my way is better. That's saying I'm offended by what you just said to me. Or how you're acting towards me, I'm offended. I'm, I'm done. That's what you're saying. But love is not offended. It's full of grace. What blessings await you when people hate you and exude you and mock you and curse you as evil because you follow the Son of Man? When that happens, be happy. Yes, leap for joy for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, their ancestors treated the ancient prophets the same way. Sensible people control their temper. They earn respect by overlooking wrongs. Here's our action step with this. Don't be offended. Following Jesus means loving generously. I don't know how many times I've read that verse there on the screen at weddings. Love never gives up. It never loses faith. It's always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. I can't think of a wedding that I've done and I can't think of a wedding that I've been to where 1 Corinthians chapter 13 isn't read. I also can't think of a time where I've been reading that to them where they're probably really more focused on each other and what's taking place and everybody that is there than they are really hearing that. Pastor Jim did Whitney and I's wedding. If I were to go back and watch the video, I probably wasn't listening really heavily to Jim either. I was excited about getting married. But if we really stop and we think about what Paul is saying here, and more importantly, what Paul is trying to explain to, uh, the, you know, to all of us as his followers, as his disciples, is that this love that Paul is writing about and, and that some of the disciples experienced and saw when Jesus died and, and was beaten is a love that's not just a love that takes and gives, but a love that goes beyond what we can even understand. In fact, he says that this love lasts forever. I mean, faith and hope and love, these are things that last forever, but the greatest of these is love. And what Paul was trying to explain and what really when as a pastor, when you're trying to, to read these things and you're standing before, you know, a husband and a wife and, and two people that are going to get married is simply that love, God's love, never, ever, ever quits. Agape love, God's love, never, ever, ever quits. 
God's love. I'm not talking about the phileo love. You invite me to your house, so I invite you to my house. You did me a favor, so I'll do you a favor. I'm not talking about that kind of a love. I'm talking about a love that never, ever, ever quits. Read it with me. Love never, ever, ever quits. So there's a little tension in me when we say this. Following Jesus means loving generously. And the reason for that is, is that really the word generous is important and it, and it kind of gives us an example of what loving like God is like. I mean, age read you a few different examples of, of types of love. But when we think about following Jesus and we understand the Greek word for, for love, is specifically in this passage of Scripture that we're reading, what we realize is, is that we've got an incomplete word there. And we wrestled with that, and, and, and we decided that if we started the message with following love, following Jesus means loving agape, which we're going to tell you what that means in just a second, many of us would check out because we'd say, I can't love like that. But the reality is there's a better word for love than generously, and it's the word that Jesus is using. It's the word that, that describes what he did for us when he died on the cross. It's the word that, that Paul is talking about in this passage of Scripture and some other passages as well, and it's the word unconditionally. You see, following the leader is following Jesus' example of loving others unconditionally. And as soon as we say that, we check out. Because it's, it's hard for us to even fathom loving like that. And I remember even as a kid hearing this word agape and it being described as a love that God has for us. But it's also a love that we are to have for each other. Don't believe me? Jesus said, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. When you study the word loved in this passage of Scripture, it has the same meaning as 1 Corinthians has, which is agape. Just as I have agape you, you should agape each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Your love for one another will prove that you're following the leader. I know Garrett gave an example of a tip. That's the tip of the iceberg. The love that prays for their enemies. The love that that's willing to forgive someone who molested you. Not given a tip. Who who hurt you. The love who's willing to forgive a transgression against someone that's so indescribable that you don't even want to talk about it or think about it. This love that God can give us as we fill our lives with God, as we, as we seek God, as we ask Him into our heart, as we chase after Him, this love that we don't possess. It's not a love that you possess. If, if you're listening online today and you don't even know if you're looking for God, you want someone to love you, 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 you need this kind of love, you're hungry for this kind of love. I mean, people, we, we, we seek out 
travel sports for for you know a, a group to to love us or, or or we seek out a bar to to we think it's alcohol but maybe to seek someone who will love us or 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 that teenage girl who doesn't have a dad who who's looking for someone to love them and so they they seek that affection out in, in a guy i mean there's all kinds of different ways that that we could potentially seek it out but we'll always find wanting but this love that jesus has for us who he died on a cross for us and and he was raised on the third day. That love that he had that sent him to the cross is available because the tomb is empty. And as we connect ourselves to his love, he gives us this love to pay it forward to others. So that we can look at someone who's hurt us and say, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive me because I didn't know what I was doing. This morning, I want to challenge us today with this idea that it's not just that Jesus has agape love for us. It's that we can give agape love to others. Love is patient. Agape love is patient. Well, I'm not patient. Well, neither am I. But God's love in us is patient. Well, I'm just not a patient person. I'm just not a kind person. I'm just not a joyful person. But God is. So how do we do this? We have to first begin by believing that we can love unconditionally. And then we have to choose through pursuing Jesus to love unconditionally. So, so let me just say this today. Following Jesus means loving unconditionally. But we don't have to chase that. We just have to chase Jesus. We have to seek his love. We have to every day get up and and say, Lord, fill me with your love. Fill me with your goodness. Fill me with your fruits of the spirit. Fill me. If there's anything, see if there's any offensive way in me. We can't seek what is in Jesus's hand. We have to seek Jesus. and He'll give us those things that are in his hand. Today, maybe there's someone that it's hard to understand this love because you haven't, you haven't experienced it. I mean, you'd just be happy with phileo love. Just someone being, for phileo means friend. You'd just be happy with a friendship love. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever would believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. This morning with every head bowed and every eye closed, you can't give something you haven't experienced. Today, if you'd like to experience his love for the first time, or you want a fresh dose of that love, simply pray this, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I invite you into my heart. And Father, my heart of pain and hurt or hatred or or selfishness or whatever it is for you, I pray that you would take that out. And I receive your unconditional love that I didn't earn it. I didn't do anything to deserve it, but you did it for me. And Father, I choose to pursue you so that you can begin to give me more and more because we never arrive but more and more of your nature and your love with every head bowed and every eye closed if you prayed that prayer would you slip your hand up real quick amen amen Lord Jesus today Father not only can we experience it but maybe like me many of us need to pray God Would you make sure, Lord, that you're first in my life? 
And so, Father, today I choose to put you first above everything else and everyone else. And I pray, Lord, today that I would follow your example. They will know we are Christians by our love. Lord, maybe for somebody today, they need to forgive. They're holding on to something that is causing them, Lord, to not reveal you. Father, today, would you call them to to forgiveness today? Lord, if there's someone in here, Lord, that's struggling, feeling like, Lord, they need to give up, they've lost hope in their marriage or in their finances or in some way, shape, or form today, Father, would you allow them to embrace, to never quit? Father, if there's someone in here today who's feeling suicidal or feeling just depressed, Lord, may they know your love today and experience it, Lord, afresh today. Father, we thank you and we give you praise for who you are and what you want to do in us so we can demonstrate it through us. In Jesus' name. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Have a great day. Sunday.